Good evening, Vintage Church. How you guys doing? Man. It's been a little while. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the first time in a while, my name's Stephen. I'm the pastor here. You are here on the second week of a series that we started last week. Didn't Pastor Daniel do a great job last week? Come on. Where we started studying the book of Daniel. There's so many things in the book of Daniel that happened to Daniel that the Lord wants to speak into our day. You know, I say this a lot, but the Bible is not just a book that you read. It's not just a book about this history that happened long ago. It's not just a book about what happened. It's a book about what always happens. It's an eternal book. And there are so many things we're going to learn, especially as we kind of go into the summer, come back up into the fall about how God has called his church to remain faithful and to uh, really act in courage in the midst of a wicked, wicked culture, to have courage in Babylon. You know, one of the things I absolutely love about Wednesday nights is we get an opportunity to kind of slow down and take a little extra time. Again, if maybe this is your first time coming on a Wednesday night, we don't rush a ton of things. We really want to spend some time. And I got to tell you, I was so overwhelmed by the baptisms. Wasn't that incredible? Come on, let's give it up. <laughs> you know, in the new building, have you guys noticed the steel out there? It's going up. They're, they're working this way. We've got portables going up in the back, but in the new building, the baptismal is going to be in the stage and it's going to be heated. It's going to be aromatic. Come on. And it's, I'm trying to get them to put in some jets. I'm not really sure exactly why we would want jets, but I'm trying to work it out. And so we're going to be really uh, putting baptism at the forefront of what we do in our church. It really is a picture of the answer uh, to our fallen world. If you've not thought about it, you go into the water, your old man or woman, you come out, your new man or woman. It truly is a new life in Christ. And as we look at culture and we see all the wickedness happening around us, it's tempting to shake our fist and to curse the darkness, but God's called us to be the light. Only the people of the light of Jesus Christ can shine that light. And that is really the picture of baptism, but it's also the reason why we decided to teach the book of Daniel going into the summer. You know, there's a biblical pattern that happens. It's multi-generational. We see it with the people of Israel uh, throughout uh, all of Scripture. I don't know if you've noticed this, but when God wants to get your attention in the Bible, pay attention to the things He repeats. By the way, we have a lot of teenagers and young people in here. You should also do the same. When your parents repeat themselves, they're serious. Come on. They mean what they say. God does too. And here's the pattern. There's a generation that experiences God. They walk with God. They're passionate about God. Then they have kids. Another reason I love child dedication. And in the busyness of life, they forget that everything God's given them, including their children, is really their stewardship. Your kids belong to God. He's giving you uh, authority and responsibility to raise them up. And many times what happens from the first generation, they're passionate about God. They have their children. And, and, and although they knew God, their kids know about God. They read these stories kind of disconnected. For them, maybe church isn't a Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, maybe even a potluck or an event on Saturday thing. It's an hour on Sunday. It gets further and further and further away from the centrality of their, the central position rather of their life. And then they have kids. And I believe this is where we find ourselves. Their kids know not God. This is the pattern. And I'm gonna tell you, this is important. Because every time you see this pattern and you find yourself in the know not God place, look around our world, we're in the they know not God. Look around. They've forgotten. That's in, that soil is the place in which God shows up in powerful ways. This is what led the people of Israel to be hauled off to Babylon, where they would be captive once again. Psalm, 1, Psalm 11 Three says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? This verse is part of a psalm attributed to King David, expressing trust in the Lord, even in the face of adversity. It reflects on the challenge that he had and that we have today of maintaining faith in righteousness when the moral or societal foundations seem to be crumbling all around us. Again, the foundation is the Word of God. God says this in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Today... God says, I have given you, I love this, today, not then, today, right now. You know, every day you wake up with a choice. Today, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessing and curses. 
Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. This was another time where God had blessed the children of Israel. They had allowed an entire generation of unbelieving people to die. A new generation was coming up. They were getting ready to go into the promised land. Their, the leadership was changing. This was Moses' last address to the people of Israel before Joshua would take the reins and they would go into their promised land. This verse is part of Moses' speech urging the people to follow God's commandments and to choose life by loving and obeying the Lord first. And that would result not in just their own prosperity, but also in the prosperity of future generations. Write this down if you're taking notes. More than anything else, we, you and me, must return to God, to His will and His ways. This is something that was in the heart of Daniel. It was in the heart of his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, They maintained in their heart, we saw what the previous generations did. We saw the consequences of them walking away from God. It doesn't matter where we are, we are going to plant our feet. We are going to give it everything we've got. If you have your Bible, turn to Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. A little bit of context of this book. The book of Malachi, the final book of the Old Testament, addresses the spiritual decline of Israel following their return from exile. This was written after the time of Daniel. God blessed them, sent them back to their homeland. They got all their stuff set up. And then, guess what happened? They went right back to the same pattern we see in Scripture. It was written around 430 BC. It highlights the people's prosperity when faithful to God and the chaos that ensues when they neglect their spiritual and their societal duties. Malachi critiques corrupt worship practices, evil in their communities, sexual depravity. He calls for them to repent and to return to the adherence of God's law. After the book of Malachi, Malachi, God doesn't speak for another 400 years until John the Baptist comes on the scene, the forerunner to the Messiah. Guess what John the Baptist, guess what his message was? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Malachi 3, 7 says this, Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me, this is important, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. A lot of times, what do we say? We have problems, we have situations that happen in our life. We cry out, God be with me. Wrong question. Wrong prayer. What we need to be thinking in those moments isn't, is God with me, but am I with God? You see, repentance comes before revival. Repentance comes before deliverance. Judgment starts in the house of God, and it's good because we have the grace of Jesus. All we have to do is turn back to Him, and everything else follows. I want you to think about this, but your family is the sum of the parents. The community is the sum of the family. The state is the sum of the community. And the nation is the sum of the states. It all starts with individual men and women of God taking responsibility and returning to Him. That's what we're really talking about. It's difficult to have courage when the foundations are destroyed and you're not building your life and your faith on the promises on the precepts, on the truth of Scripture. Last week, Pastor Daniel did a great job, and he opened up Daniel. I'm going to remind you some context of the situation Daniel finds himself in, because I know sometimes we can, turn, we can look around and go, it's so bad! Can I just tell you, Daniel had a lot worse than you and I do. And the same principles apply. He was young, an upcoming leader at Jerusalem High School. He was talented, he was a great student, he was good-looking, he was brilliant. He seemingly had everything going for him until one day Babylon comes to town. The Babylonian Empire actually attacked Jerusalem three times, and each time they abducted more and more Jewish people. Due to Daniel's giftings and potential, he was deported with the first group 500 miles east to Babylon to enter the service of the wicked king Nebuchadnezzar. This young Jewish boy was stripped from his country. Yes, he was a boy. 
his home, his family, and his culture, and he would never return. The entire book of Daniel, he would never return. In chapter 1, we see Daniel and his friends are placed under the care of Asphanaz, the overseer of the king's eunuchs. Many scholars believe that Daniel was also made a eunuch. So for Daniel, not only was he ripped from his home and his country, but there would be no marriage, no wife, and no children. Daniel could have easily become bitter in life, yet he settled in his heart to trust his life and future to the hands of God. That is the beginning of any great story. And least we look at these stories and think to ourselves, it's because they were really, really good people. No. We serve a really, really good God who even when we don't measure up, even when we fall on our face, the Bible says that a righteous, though they fall a thousand times, what, are, what makes them different than the wicked? They get back up and they keep moving. You see, the world will tell you, just throw away your values, throw away your ideal because they're so impossible. But it's those things that actually draw the best of us for everyone in our life. And we're striving forward in Christ. You know, there are always three responses to cultural pressure for believers and churches. The first response is we curse. I mean, you guys have ever done that? Come on, don't lie. This is church. This is church. You look at what's going on, the butchering of children in the name of science. It's not really science. It's an ancient pagan cult. It's been around a long time. We see the complete chaos happening at our borders. By the way, nations, borders, and laws are God's idea. We're going to talk about that more in the fall. We see absolute corruption at the highest level. Sure, politics is always ugly and they're always corrupt, but it's never been quite this overt and in your face. What's the temptation we have? We stick our head in the sand like an ostrich. We go Y2K for some of you older people. Come on. We start surfing the web for prepper supplies and guns, maybe even some land in Montana. Come on. It's not what God's called us to do. We're not called to curse. We, we, we compromise. This is the next thing that we do. Many of us, we capitulate. We compromise. This is the stance of the vast major, majority of churches in America right now. We just say, you know what? We're just going to go along to get along. We roll over. We give in. We surrender to culture. Well, it's just the way it is. Or I don't want to be made fun of as a Christian. Or I might lose my job. We compromise. I believe what the Bible teaches us to do is to occupy. Jesus says we must not curse the darkness. We must be light. We must not compromise. We must stand firm. And ultimately, we don't get permission biblically to walk away. We must occupy. Jesus says, occupy till I come. People ask me all the time, we're going to talk about some end time prophecy in here. I'll preface it by saying one day we're going to stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords having all of our eschatological ideas have been tested we're going to look at Jesus and go, wow, I didn't think you were going to do it that way. People ask me all the time, Pastor, do you think we're, do you think this is the end of the days? Do you think we're living in the end times? I said, I don't have any idea, but I do know it's your end time. And once that hourglass runs empty, you get no more. And you will not be judged based on what could have happened or what you think should have happened. You're going to stand before God. Stripped bare all your intentions, who you really are, and what you did with God gave with what God gave you. The Bible says you're going to answer for that. Daniel is a fantastic example of a high impact believer in a culture that did not honor God. If Daniel can honor God in Babylon, you can honor God here. If Daniel can stand right, amidst incredible cultural pressure. He had so much pressure. You're about to learn a story. Lots of pressure. If he can do it, so can you. You know, there really are three types of Christians and churches. First, you have the cowardly church. And I've watched it over and over again. They're so scared. And you know, this is important. Prosperity tends to make you weak. This is what happens. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, not stuff. But that word in the Aramaic is mammon. It means money when personified as a god. It means loving the gift more than the giver. And for many of us, 
We just, we like our comfort. I know you're like, man, I'm so glad I came Wednesday night. Can we get to the good stuff? It's cowardice, let's be honest. We don't want to lose things. We don't like change. And yet, change is impossible without change. It starts in our own heart. Next, there's the complicit. We see this all the time. You can call them the Wokies. They never really understood the Bible. They never really spent time in Scripture. They're leading their people astray. The people that go along for influence, for their tax-exempt status. Right? To not be called bad, bad and mean names online. Then there, then there are the courageous. Then there are the courageous. And those are the people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Those are the people like the saints of old that stood no matter what down to their very life because they understood that what you see is not all there is. You know, one day we're going to get to heaven. We're going to get into the new heaven and new earth. We have a new body. It's going to be amazing. And we're going to be blown away, blown away by how much more real that is than anything we're experiencing now. The Bible says what we go through, they're momentary. Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You know he wasn't on the cross all the time. Some Christians act like they're on the cross all the time. You've seen them? They never come down from the cross. And in proportion to his life, he was up there for a very small period of time. He wasn't marked by that. He was a happy, joyful person. Despair is a sin for a believer. I want to say that. It doesn't mean you won't have moments where you're down and you're out. And I'm sure you have some mental health language that veils a spiritual emptiness that we blame on physiology and genetics. But when in reality, much of what we struggle with is deeply spiritual. I believe the church is being sifted and I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I think for far too long in prosperity, we can get the best of our foot in the church. We look like a really good person but also kind of in the world, you know? It's kind of like a mullet, you know what I mean? Business in the front, party in the back, come on. That's how we act, isn't it? Here's the problem with riding the Finch Church, and this is something Daniel and his friends refused to do. They were not the only ones taken. When the idol was put up, they had all kinds of friends that looked like them, talked like them, they were a part of their racial identity, whatever that means. And guess what? They said, just, just don't get us in trouble. You represent all of us. You're going to give us a bad name. If it doesn't work out for you, we're all dead. There's constant pressure, even from within, to bow. The church is being sifted. Here's the thing about the fence. The devil owns the fence. The devil owns the fence. Much of what we see in the test that God allows you to go through is to get you off the fence. Your best life also isn't on the fence. Bible speaking to one of the churches in Revelation. We're going to cover that next. Are you guys excited? Come on. Demons and angels and dragons. I mean, come on. <laughs> the devil owns the fence. One of the churches, he says, I believe it's Revelation 3, they're lukewarm, neither hot or cold. They're like that puddle, you know, mosquitoes, malaria grows in, you know, just kind of stagnant, just kind of still. The Bible says he spits those people out of his mouth. Why? Because he wants you off the fence, off the fence. We saw courage last week in Babylon. Daniel and his friends are set on a three-year fast track to train them to be on King Nebuchadnezzar's leadership team. New learning language and laws. And yet even under the pressure, Daniel holds to his convictions and refuses to compromise by eating the food offered at the king's table. He has to be on a simple diet of vegetables and water. My wife's been trying to get me to do that for years. Come on. And yet Daniel doesn't compromise. After 10 days, Daniel and his friends look better than all the rest. Daniel 1-2 says they were 10 times better. You know what happens when you stand with God? You're 10 times better. You know what happens even when people try to fear you in to compromise and you don't? You're so much better. And courage always begets more courage. This is what I've learned. As I've surrounded myself with courageous people, I didn't start off this, cour this cour courageous. You know, some people are just made for peace. And then some people are made for the other thing. Come on. But as I've surrounded myself with people who have stand, stood true, I don't mean being mean and hateful. You know, you can say tough stuff and smile. You can say it slow and follow it with bless your heart. There's all kinds of things you can do. You don't have to be a jerk. You don't, you don't necessarily have to do or say things like I do. But you know what God's called you to do. 
when you get alone and you look at your face in the mirror, when you read this story on your own before bed or when you wake up, you know if you're most like that person or you're least like that person. And here's the thing about being around courageous people. This is why the church is so important. That's why we don't rush this on Wednesday night. I know some of you are going, man, it's been long already. We went to a conference last week, man, preacher preached for two and a half hours. Me and Pastor Steve were looking and going, man, we are spiritually out of shape. <laughs> What happens when you get around men and women of courage, of faith? It's not about uniformity, but it is about unity. And there's something about courage and an attitude of faith that just gets on you when you leave. And all of a sudden, in that atmosphere of faith, the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to... I didn't even start on my notes. I'm going to get there. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if that's true, how many of y'all want to get some more faith? The Bible says in Hebrews, faith is two things. You must believe that there's a God in heaven. In other words, there's a God in heaven and you are not him. And then it's not just enough to believe there's a big bad man up there ready to zap you like most religious people believe. That's religion. It's not faith. It's tradition. It's not faith. It's fear. It's not faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. The Bible goes on to say there's a second condition. You, you can't just believe that God's over you, above you, more powerful than you, more knowing than you. You also have to believe that he's good to you, that he rewards you if you diligently seek him. Isn't that the attitude of a parent? It's the heart of God. Sometimes we miss that in faith. It's not about avoiding. It's not about fear. It's about courage and standing, knowing that the God of the universe is on your side. Today, we're looking at a dream of the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. This is perhaps one of the most powerful tests of God's sovereignty. Daniel would outlast three empires, the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Persians, all the way up to Alexander the Great. This one chapter provides a biblical overview of humanity's future kingdoms and end-time events. Without this chapter, no one can understand Matthew 24 through 25, Luke 21, Mark 13, or the entire book of Revelation. It's why we wanted to teach it first. Here's the lie. You don't need the whole Bible. You just need the gospel. You can't understand the gospel outside of the context of all of Scripture. You can't understand the gospel without the Old Testament. Romans eleven seventeen says, but some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel, some, not all, that's important, have been broken off. And you Gentiles, who were branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessings God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. Look what it says. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch, not the root. He goes on to say, you too can fall into the same trap that we see repeated in Scripture over and over and over again. And before you get all puffed up, right, you new covenant believers, come on. New and better covenant. Before you get puffed up, you could fall into the same trap and be cut off, just like some, not all, of the people of Israel were. When you're reading the Bible, I'm going to say this in every one of these series, just so that you firmly understand, when you're reading Scripture, a lot of people get confused because they don't know who the authors are talking to. There are only three people groups, lots of different names and tribes, but there are only three major people groups in all of the Bible. Okay, write this down. First, you have the Jew. The nation of Israel, the Jewish people of the 12 tribes. The Bible's talking to the Jew. Then you have the Gentile. That's everyone else. They go by different names, different kingdoms, but they're not Jew. That's the Gentile. And then you have the church. This is very important because there's lots of things spoken about in Daniel that speak specifically to one, all, or some of these people. And we're going to help you understand that as well. Daniel in the dream. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. First you have King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. One night in Babylon, mighty King Nebuchadnezzar has trouble sleeping. Daniel 2, 1 and 2 says, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call all the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. The king takes his trouble 
to bed with him. He can't sleep. He tosses, he turns. He has a strange, disturbing dream. This is also important to note that high rank is no guarantee of peace. Money, power, and acclaim cannot calm the troubled soul, not even the king. So be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you desire or what you think will solve all of your problems. When Nebuchadnezzar awakes, he may or, ne- may, or n- may or may not have been able to remember the dream or perhaps only part of it. He calls everyone together and he commands them to tell him both the dream and the interpretation. Like a 1-900, like 1-900 psychic number, seriously. They respond to him, king, tell us the dream and we can make up something to help you sleep. And he's not having it because I don't think he believed in any of it anyways. And he says, no, 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 no. You're going to tell me the dream. Then you're going to interpret it. or I'm going to kill everybody. Everybody also included Daniel and his friends because he was in the king's council. When Daniel hears about this death sentence, which includes him and his three friends, he doesn't immediately go off to Facebook to talk about it. He doesn't process and get consensus with his friends. You know what the first thing he does is? He falls on his face and he prays. What would happen in our life if prayer was a first resort, not a last resort? How much suffering would we avoid? How much information and processing with God? I tell people this all the time. You know, you do not need to vent. There is nothing scientific or spiritually speaking in the word or in your physiological body or minds that think that when you just say a bunch of crazy stuff, it leaves you. All it does is reveals you and what was in your heart. And faith comes by hearing, which means you just heard all of it. Then you just reinforced it all because it came back through your ears. I tell people all the time, you do not need to do that. People are like, oh, I just want to process with you, Pastor. I go, I don't want to process with you. (laughs) I don't want to have all your drama. I don't want to hear your one side of the story because then I'm going to have to get involved My emotions are going to go up and down, and I'm not even a part of this. I ask him all the time, did you go directly to him? No. I said, so here's what you need to do. You need to process with the Lord. Then he's going to give you two choices. Bring it up or grow up. If he tells you to bring it up, man, go bring it up. And Matthew 18 tells you exactly how to do that. And what happens when crazy people don't listen? That's why you need the church and you need leaders. You know, you can't just quit another Christian without doing it Jesus' way. Meaning that you you have to involve elders and pastors. You know why? Because likely, you just might have a two-by-four in your eye. It's not about getting a bunch of people together to mob somebody. It's about getting to the truth. And most of the time, 99.999% of the time, mature people can grow up. And they just realize, you know what? I don't get the sunshine without the rain in relationships. Some things, you know, listen, anybody been married more than five minutes? Whatever you focus on, grows in your marriage. You focus on everything that's negative, guess what the only thing you're going to see is? That's called a two-by-four in your eye. So you get a problem, you bring it to leaders, and the leaders go, you know what, actually, you're a jerk. You know what, actually, it's your fault. You know what, actually, you have an unrealistic expectation. That's why people don't want to take things to pastors. That's why they avoid pastors. The Bible says that a righteous person or a sheep goes through the gate. A wolf is the one that jumps over the fence and goes behind the back. Always remember that. And and I'm going to tell you, I'm telling you, I don't know what it is, but there's some people, man, they can go from sheep to goat to wolf. And then back to sheep. And you're just like, whoa, what just happened? Anyways, not in my notes. Pray first, not last. You guys okay? Daniel 2.27. This might be taken as the theme of all of chapter 2. The secret which the king has demanded the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians. So Daniel shows up, he prays, God gives him the interpretation. Here's what he says. The secret which the king has demanded, the secret which you demanded, you completely unreasonable person. That's what he's trying to say in a respectful way. You're crazy, king. This this can only be given to you from God. Look what happens. The wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But you know that nation you invaded and carried off. They serve a God in heaven. I love this. Daniel doesn't take credit. He could have. He didn't. He says, there's a God in heaven. That's not you, king. That's above you. This is going to come up in future weeks because Nebuchadnezzar keeps forgetting this, just like you and me do. You see? 
He forgets and he has to be reminded. He alone reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in later days. Here, human inability is fully met by God's almighty power. Nothing is impossible for God. God gave King Nebuchadnezzar a future prophecy, a prophecy of four world kingdoms. The dream itself takes only a few verses to describe. Let's read Daniel 2, 31 through 35. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. This image, this image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet of iron and partly of clay. The dream is both simple and strange. The king sees an enormous statue made of four different metals, head of gold, chest of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron mixed with clay. Clearly, there's an emphasis on the types of metal. The key to understanding the four metals of the statue starts in Daniel chapter 238 when Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold on the top of the statue. He goes on to speak of the other three metals, which are successive world kingdoms. In Daniel 239 through 40, but after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another. I love this because Daniel would be alive for these two. He would see them coming. Then another, a third kingdom of broads shall rule over all the earth and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron and as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. The statue is symbolic representation of four successive world kingdoms. And Jesus calls all of these kingdoms the age of the Gentiles. From the overtaking of Judah by Babylon... Israel had a place of world dominion again, hence the term, the A, or never again, had a place of world dominion, hence the term, the age of the Gentiles. So in this vision, only the first kingdom is clearly defined. That's the Babylonian empire. However, we learn from Daniel's vision in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, 20 and 21, that the next two kingdoms are the Medo-Persian empire and the Greek empire, which was ruled by Alexander the Great. Josephus, a Roman historian, wrote, that when Alexander came to the city of Jerusalem, the high priest met with him. Alexander, he said, you're mentioned in the Bible. Then the priest opens the book of Daniel and shows him where he fits in the prophetic picture. Alexander the Great was so moved that he spared the city of Jerusalem. Both of these empires were still yet to come during the time of Daniel. The fourth kingdom, the mightiest of them all, is never clearly named in Daniel. Although according to most every scholar, the legs of iron refer to the Roman Empire, which overtook Greece in world history. So we've got four kingdoms. Then suddenly, in this vision, a stone strikes the statue at its feet, shattering the entire statue. The pieces are blown away by the wind all over the world, leaving only the stone, which becomes a mountain and then feels, fills the whole earth. Next, we see the kingdom of God on earth. Daniel 2, 34 and 35, he says, you watched king while a stone was cut out without hands, that cornerstone mentioned in the New Testament, which stuck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. The wind carried them away that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the entire earth. Note that when the stone hits the statue, it doesn't hit the head, the chest, the thighs, or the legs, but strikes the feet and toes of iron mixed with clay. There's a prophetic twofold meaning here. First, the kingdom of God represented by the stone is ushered in Christ's birth as the Roman Empire rules the world. This is the stone that strikes the fourth kingdom, which is Rome. This stone also points to Christ coming back to the earth a second time to establish his millennial kingdom, which we'll talk about later which will smash the governments of mankind that are allied against, that are allied together in the last days under the leadership of the person the Bible calls the Antichrist, also mentioned. We're going to learn more about that later in the series in the book of Revelation. The stone mentioned in Daniel 2.34, while seemingly the least in value, wasn't as expensive as the gold, the silver, and the bronze. Least in value, particularly in relation to gold and silver, fills the earth and overtakes the other kingdoms in the end. I have a diagram I'm going to show you. We're going to have many more of these. I'm getting, you, uh, I'm getting you prepared for Revelation. I have all kinds of charts. I'm going John Hagee on you. Come on, somebody. You see all of these kingdoms. Daniel would serve these three. These were kind of two mixed in. And then you see all of them there all the way to the kingdom of God, which we're living out 
uh, now, up until the second coming of Christ. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 21, 42. Have you never read in the Scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. As we close, Daniel chapter 2, 46 through 48. After Daniel stood, the Daniel went to God first, took a chance trusting the Lord. Daniel 2, 46, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets since you could reveal this secret. Verse 48, then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Here we see Daniel stands and he's promoted. Daniel stands, he does what God's called him to do, which at the time felt like crazy. I mean, imagine the emotions in just 24 hours. You got this crazy, psychotic king who knows what he was smoking the night before. Nobody knows. God gives him a dream. He freaks him out so much. He, he has to get an answer. He demands they tell both the dream and the interpretation. All that fear, Daniel goes to God in prayer. God gives Daniel an answer. But God also positions Daniel's feet to be promoted. He positions Daniel to be able to step into a place of influence that without this dream, it would have never happened. What would happen in your life if you saw the mountains, the obstacles, the things you want to curse, the things you want to run away from? What if you saw them as an opportunity for God to show his power in your life? That's exactly what they are. God could have picked any time in human history to plant you here, just like he planted Daniel there. Daniel ran his race. We're going to learn all about his story in the coming weeks, and it gets better and better and better. Marvel has nothing on this story. Unbelievable what God does. But like Daniel, you and I, he didn't know how his story was going to end. We get to read about it centuries later, and we get to go, oh yeah, that's obvious. Go with God. But in the moment, everything he knew was taken from him. He had every excuse to be resentful, to be bitter, to blame the system for all of it, even to shake his fist at God. And yet, he didn't. And it made all of the difference. Daniel took a stand. He stayed committed to God. He stood on his convictions and he walked with courage. As a result, God favored and blessed him. God raised him up right in the middle of a godless culture. And God will do the same for you and me today. I believe that as Christ followers, we don't need to escape or check out of culture, nor do we need to give in. We are called to be difference makers, to engage, to occupy till he comes. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the power of your word. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in this church. So many lives changed. Thank you, Father, for what you've done, for what you're doing, but what you're also going to do as we walk through a season of opposition, as we stand courageously, as we love the way you love in truth and in grace. I pray that you would continue to protect us, to hold us up when we can't stand. Lord God, to surround us with other believers Lord God, whose courage would spill on us. And Father, most of all, I pray that God, as we walk through this time, this season of our lives, Father, you're preparing and setting us up for promotion. You're preparing and setting us up for greater influence. This world and all the things we worry about are passing away, but your word never passes away. It's eternal. I pray that we would continue to build our lives on it, 
we would hook our carriages to it, and we would trust you in faith. God, I also pray for anybody in here that doesn't know you. I pray, God, they wouldn't leave here the same person that they came in as. That, Father, they would surrender their lives to you, Lord Jesus, that they would make you the Lord of their life. They would accept what you did on the cross and paying the penalty for their sin. That, Father, they would grasp the life that you purchased for them through the power of the resurrection. And that, Lord, they would live changed, walking fully into all that you have for them. I pray, God, by your spirit, people get right with you. His heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one looking around. We're almost finished. One of the things we do at every single service, at every location, every time, is we provide a place and a space for people who are far from God to draw near to him. Maybe today you find yourself far from God. Listen, I don't have to embarrass you. I don't have to ask you an awkward question. I don't even have to thump you with my Bible. You know if you're playing with God and God knows. Maybe at one point you followed him, but you're not following him today. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ because of your own pride. Because like Nebuchadnezzar, you're the God of your life. But you hit a wall that you can't get around, you can't get over, you can't crawl under. God does that so that you'll humble yourself. The Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Turn to Jesus. I can save you a lot of heartache and pain. You will never be all that you were created to be apart from a relationship with the creator and you cannot get to him apart from Jesus. He purchased your freedom for dying for your sins on the cross, but he also rose from the dead so that you too could rise. His heads are bowed, eyes are closed. In a moment, I'm gonna pray for anybody in here that's far from God and wants to change that. If you're in here today, and you'd say, that's me, and you want to be included in this prayer, would you just let me know by putting up your hand? Is there anybody in here like that that say, Pastor, that's me, thank you. you? Put your hand up, put it right back down. Put it up, put it back down. I see you, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I see you. I see you. Thank you. It's the most important decision you can make. Without it, you can't move forward. It's not a parking space. It's not your get out of jail, hell free card. It's an on-ramp to everything God has for you. It starts with an act of free will getting off the throne of your life and putting Jesus there. Is there anyone else? You say, Pastor, that's me. Pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. In a moment, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. If you raise your hand and you really meant it, I wanna encourage you to say this prayer just loud enough where you can hear your own voice. People of faith surrounding you are gonna also pray loud and in faith so as to encourage yours. But I believe that God's gonna meet you where you are. One thing I know about God is he doesn't leave you there and neither are we. We're gonna give you steps to grow and a place to belong and connect and to grow up into all that God has for you. But first, you've got to get your life right with him. Church, we believe in what they're doing. Let's pray this prayer all together. Let's pray, Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth, for living a perfect life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I believe that you are good and I believe you're God. I believe on the third day after you were killed on the cross, I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you defeated death once and for all to give me life once and for all. And so today, of my own free will, I choose to make you my Lord, my Savior, and my King. Lead me and guide me. Show me what's next. It's in your name that I pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, church, let's put our hands together.